Let's get into the Word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for just what you're doing here in our midst and in this world. You are the hope of the world. You are the God who's on, always in control, and we trust in you, especially in times of uncertainty. We trust that you're going to answer our prayers. Trust that you are a promise keeper. Trust that we can cast our burdens to you and, and, and you care. Trust that you will supply all our needs according to your riches and glory. Trust that all the areas of our lives of concern are in your hand. Nothing, Lord God, you always think of everything. And so we're trusting right now for your anointing on your servant right now. Use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have you ever given yourself bad advice? Just by showing hands, those of you online just say, put emoji. You've given yourself, most of us would agree that we've given. So it's not like we intentionally wanted to give ourselves bad advice, right? And not like I wanted, but there, I found from my own experience, and I'm sure you have too, that there are certain circumstances in life that, in life that come our way that cloud our judgment when it comes to seeking good counsel or seeking good advice. Unfortunately, if we're not careful, what can happen is that we begin to start to listen to ourselves and doing things without thinking it through. We think what's best for the moment. But how many know what's best for the moment could really mess you up in the future, right? So is there ever a time we should not take our own advice? As we continue our series, Bad Advice, that's the question I'm going to ask you today. Because I have found from my own experience that is, it is when we find ourselves in circumstances of despair, of hopelessness, we become so desperate that we begin to say, you know what, I got to do what I got to do to get myself out of it. It's been said, desperate times calls for desperate measures. How many of you have heard that? And what that means is extreme and undesirable circumstances or situations can only be resolved by equally extreme action. See, we don't like when we find ourselves in a hopeless situation, where it just seems that your hands are tied. There's nothing you can do about it. We want things to change. We want things to progress. But sometimes in life, we find ourselves in positions or places where nothing seems to be happening, nothing seems to be going our way. And, if though, and especially if they're matters of the heart, things that are close to us, things that really are important to us, we begin to get stressed out. We begin to feel pain. And then at that moment, the one thing we're looking for is what? Relief. I just want to get out of this. I mean, no one wants to find themselves. That's why we go, you know, we go to the doctor. And, oh, when we have pain, we, we do whatever. We find a rem home remedy or something. Simply why? Because we don't like pain. We don't like it. So when we find ourselves in a painful situation, we often give ourselves bad advice. And that's what gets us into trouble. Can I say, can you say amen with me? Amen. That's what gets you in trouble. And for some people, they have, they're, they're living in a perpetual cycle of continual trouble and drama. And they don't understand why. Have you ever counseled someone and they did the complete opposite? <laughs> and so we know people like that in our lives, they do the complete. But the problem is, I understand if they do it one time, but it just seems that they never take good advice. They don't take anyone's good advice. Because I mean, you know, there's good, bad advice out there, but there's also good advice. But at the end of the day, it's a choice you make. And unfortunately, if we listen to ourselves, we're going to take our bad advice, and that's going to lead us into trouble. And we're going to find evidence of that today in the Bible, because we always want to support what we feel within the confines of the Bible. And there's a wonderful story that illustrates this point excellently, and that is found in Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 to 6. Now, there's a lot of drama in this story today. Can you say drama? Drama. I mean, this is like the housewives of Israel, all right? This is, this is, this is, 
the drama that's going to be here. And if you've never read this story, never heard this story, guess what? You're going to be, you're going to say, wow, this is really messed up, okay? And this involves one woman in particular. This is the main character that we're going to focus on today, Sarai, okay? Sarai is her name. So it says, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him. But she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarah said to Abraham, the Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Bad move. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed. Another bad move, right? Mm. Boo for boys, right? Boo. With Sarah's proposal. So Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abram as a wife. This happened 10 years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. So Abram had sexual relationship with Hagar, and she became pregnant. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress, Sarai, with contempt. Then Sarai said to Abraham, this is all your fault. This is not the first time in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, people blame the blame game, you know? So here she's blaming her husband. I put my servant in your arms, and now she's pregnant, and she's treating me with contempt. The Lord will show you who's wrong, you or me. Abram replied, look, she's your servant. What do you want me to do? (laughs) So deal with it, her as you see fit. Then Sarai treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. For those who don't know what's going on, in essence, Here was a woman named Sarai who was under a lot of distress and a lot of pain. Why was she in a lot of pain? It is clear that she was unable to give or have a child. She was barren. And in those days, a barren woman would seem as something shameful. It would seem that God was against you, that God was holding back the blessing for whatever reason. And so imagine... Because at this time, Sarai was 75 years. So for 75 years, she had to deal with the the, the knowledge that she could not have kids, that she was never going to have a kid. And you notice how, and, and probably everyone around her must have looked at her a certain way. So when she was walking around the marketplace, she went, hey, you having a kid? No. You having a kid? No. Mm. I wonder what happened to her. So here she was living with this pain and, and, and feeling like she was on the outs and, and she desired to have a, a child. But by, by the age 75, you know, someone tells you they're 75 and they want to have a child, you probably laugh at them and say, you know, it's not going to happen. She knew in all reality she was not going to have a child. So what she did what to alleviate the pain that she was feeling, she did what was common at that time. And she gave the maidservant to serve as a surrogate for her. And so her maidservant, but this set a series of, of, of events and a series of drama. She put things in motion when she came up with her plan. And this began the dysfunction that we see today and experience today simply because of this story. That trouble in the Middle East, that trouble in Afghanistan, it all stems from what? From this story, from this story. And if you don't know what I'm speaking about, I'll t- well, just do some research and you will find. So here we learn from Sarah's, Sarah's example what we shouldn't do, when we shouldn't take our, our own advice. And here we're going, to give in, we're going to see four scenarios when we should not take our own advice. The first one is when we are too emotional. How many of you would consider yourself an emotional person? And, and, you know, and, and you know, when I say we're emotional, you know, it's, and I'm high emotional. And, 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 and sometimes, how many could also admit that sometimes you allow your emotions to get the best of you? And if you know someone like that, you can nudge him. You can, you can text him. Listen to this message. God is speaking. God is speaking. God is speaking. So, so you know, when I, for 75 years, this Sarah was in pain. She, like I said, she said, what did I do wrong? And it was evident she was struggling because she, she was perhaps struggling with low self-esteem. She was struggling with sadness and despair. Nothing was changing in her life. She looked at her husband and says, I can't give you the, the child that you want. She's she looking at 
at God and saying, why don't you answer my prayers? What have I done wrong? So she was in a place where she wanted to get out, and so she was highly emotional. And at that time, because she was highly emotional, she made a bad decision. She made a bad decision. One of the greatest advice that I ever gotten from someone says, when never make a major decision in your life when you are highly emotional. I got to say that again, because some of you really need to hear this. Never make an important decision in your life when you are highly emotional. So that means when you're angry, be careful what you do, because you can be angry, and you can say things, tear things up, break things up, and ah, go in your job and throw everything out, and say, oh, I don't need this, blah, blah, blah. And then you'll be like, oh, man, I needed that job. I got to pay bills. <laughs> It's all caught on camera nowadays, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and be careful when we're angry what we say. And sometimes when we find ourselves, and, and this is where we have to keep it real, when, when we're in pain, we begin to think to ourselves and our emotions like anger, anger or, or sadness, and, and, and suddenly, man, I, I got to do what I got to do to get out of this. And, 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 and so what happens is the emotions take over. And what we need to do is simply not allow our emotions to take over. We have to quiet our spirits. In Psalms 46.10, the word of the Lord tells us, be still and know that I am God. In the book of James, it's be too slow to anger, right? Slow to talk because sometimes we use our mouths to hurt. So what, do, what does that mean? It says be careful, especially if you know you're an emotional person. Hold, wait a while. Don't act at the moment. Hold back. Restrain. Ask the Holy Spirit to hold you back. Sometimes only the Holy Spirit can hold some of us back. And you know who you are because once you're in the zone, you're in the zone. And you're just going crazy. I got to throw some holy water on you, something to, 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 calm, to calm you down. But you know yourself, and it says, I'm not going to make a major decision. I've seen time and time again, perhaps you even know yourself, you made major decisions in your life, life-changing decisions. You moved here, you left this person, you did whatever you did. Why? Simply because of your emotion. So when you're highly emotional, you're going to listen to your own advice? No, you're not going to listen to your own advice. The second thing is uh, um, when we grow impatient. Now... The promises of God are there to help us through life and encourages us to believe that things are going to change. How many of us are holding on to a promise found in the Word of God? Especially when it's close to the heart, like, 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 like someone in your family is not a Christian and you're praying for them or you're praying for your circumstances or your financial situations to turn around. You're praying for things to get better. But I've noticed that when we claim the promises of God, not all the promises are answered right away. And there's a waiting period. And how many of us, by a show of hands, like to wait? Just like the first service, most of us, all of us do not like to wait for anything. I mean, the microwave takes too long. We're upset. It's been two minutes. I can't believe it. I, anything. We just want things right away. That's the kind of life we live, a fast-paced life. But when it comes to God, we have to trust in his timing. God's timing is always best. But if you've given a promise to God, Abraham was given a promise that he was given a child. But see, Sarah began to think, he says, oh, well, look, look, I'm 75. It's over. I got to do what I got to do. And so what happens many times, this is what happens when we pray to God in the back of our minds, we're saying, if, this, if God does not come through for us, I got a plan B. Many people, and I've been guilty of this, I used to give God, a, a, you know, a time limit. So I said, Lord God, if you don't answer my prayer by November, I got to do what I got to do because desperate times call for desperate measures. And I bet some of you saying, Lord God, if, I, if Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright don't come by the end of December, I got to do what I got to do. <laughs> a 
because we convince ourselves that that's, that's the thing. So because impatience, could, it, it could just drive us to the place. And there's a thing called awfulizing in, in, in counseling. We say awfulizing. So when we find ourselves, we think that awfulizing simply means that it's the worst case scenario. We think of all the worst things. Oh, we can't take this anymore. And for me, I, there was many times in my life, we, that's why God just doesn't want to focus on what we don't have, but focus on the good stuff and always be grateful because grateful always puts the balance. If you go to God all the time, and believe me, I was a big crybaby, especially when it comes to my, and my singleness. Instead of enjoying my singleness and, and being used by God, you know, I was like, because sometimes the church people make you feel that if you're single, there's something wrong with you. They look down on you. They look like, like you're not, you know, you're not saying this, you know, what's wrong with you? Why, why you know, and, and that wasn't the case. God had his perfect time, so you start to feel a certain type of way. And I remember I used to go to the prayer, the prayer all the time, pray all the time, and, 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 and pray, and, and, and especially we used to have Wednesday night prayer, and, and there was one one song that they always used to sing, you perhaps don't know it, but the song used to is always say, oh God, I used to be awfulizing, remember? Oh God, I can't live, I can't breathe anymore. I'm single, oh God, where are you going to move, oh God? Why? Oh God, why are you letting me suffer like that? <laughs> why? And the song would come on, I, I would tell you all the time, especially when I cried the loudest, like God was like, stop, stop being a crybaby. And, and, and the song, and, and, the, and, and the song was, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And then it, and I, when I used to hear that song, I used to be like, oh, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear those who wait upon the Lord. I want to hear you. it's tomorrow. I don't know about you, but if you've ever heard God, sometimes God prophetically he'll, he'll begin to answer my prayers. He says, I will answer your prayer soon. How many of you have heard that soon? And I always say, soon, your soon or my soon? Because <laughs> you're eternal. You're living forever. You're, you're <laughs> Me, I'm living it. <laughs> my, my soon is next week. You know? And, and, and just right, but look how many people in the Bible had to wait upon the Lord, but they didn't grow impatient. Joseph, in the book of Genesis, there's a man named Joseph who had a lot of dreams. Before his dream became a fulfillment, look, they said he had to wait 22 years. King David, I mean, remember in King David, in the book of Samuel, there's a little shepherd boy that God pronounces. He's going to be the next king of Israel. And, every, and every, he was sort of happy how many years passed by? 15 years before the promise. There's a guy named Joshua and Caleb in the book of Exodus. You see them. They were going to the promised land. It took them 40 years. And now Abraham and Sarah, they waited 25 years before God gave them the promised child. That's a lot of years, right? And you, most of us say, I ain't got that many years. And we grow impatient and we get upset with God. And, but God knows that I got to trust God. See, this, uh, God always answers our prayers three ways. He says, yes. We love that, right? Let's give yes, yes. Won't he do it? Yes, he will. Then he says, no. That's right. When he closed the door, some, you better thank the Lord. Because some of those doors that he closed... Ooh, thank God and go with that crazy cycle. You know what I'm saying? Oh, thank God he closed that job. Thank God, thank God, thank God, thank God, thank God. And then he says, wait. And waiting, I think, is the most painful one, right? And so what happens is when we are waiting on the Lord, don't start thinking about plan Bs. Don't start thinking about just, God, Lord God, help me, help me. One of the fruits of the Spirit is what? Patience. And I have always, I'm always asking for a double anointing of patience. And that I'm, I'm keeping it real with God because I know I get anxious, my anxious thoughts. And, and I don't want my mind always just so fixated on what I don't have. Look at what you do have. Look at the blessings you have. Look how God is using and moving work in your life. God's timing is best. That settles it. The third thing, we should never take our advice when we want to take matters into our own hands. Sarah had a plan. It may seem like a good plan, but it, and it made a lot of sense but it wasn't what God wanted. Because, but this is what she said, look, she tried to figure out God. And how many of us know it, there's always going to be a problem when you try to figure out how God's going to work? Because God's ways are not our ways. 
And his plans are not our plans. It's, it's, a, it's like his ways and his thoughts are higher than ours. And so what happens is we sometimes in our lives, you know, we, 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 want, we t- want to take matters into our own hands and says, okay, I want to push things along. I, wanna, I feel that God is going this way, but I'm just going to rush it a little. I'm going to force God's hand. I'm going to help God. How I many know oh, God doesn't need our help? There are times when we're going to be still and do nothing. There are times that we go out there and do whatever we have to do and the rest. If you're looking for a job, you, put, you just don't sit there in your room and wait, God's going to, get, I'm going to get that phone call. You go out there, you go on the internet, you do what you have to do. But at the end of the day, once you've done all you can, then you just wait on the Lord. But you don't begin to take matters into your hand and say, well, I want to do this. And we could try to manipulate God. And, 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 and Sarai could have justified her actions because what was her plan? Let me get the ser- the, my, my servant to be serve as a surrogate. It sounds like a good plan, but look what happened. Uh, and, and, and she must have said, look, well, everyone else is doing it. And just because everyone else is doing it, that means you're, gonna, you're called to do it. Don't follow the crowd, especially when God has a unique, God has made us all in unique fashion. And there are things that work for other people that may not work for you. But we got to make sure not to take matters into our own hands. When you feel that you're stepping out of, that you need to step out of the will of God. And I know people says, look, I, I have to cheat. I have to lie my taxes because, you know, God understands. You're stepping out of the will of God because you're stealing. Don't put 10 deductibles when you only got one. You can't count goldfish, okay? You just cannot. <laughs> and so what happens is, if, and then it helped that Abraham, Abram said, yeah, that sounds like a good plan. So when he said, go with Hagar, Abraham must have said, won't he do it? Because <laughs> he heard from God. And in fairness to her, God never told her at this point, God never told her she was going to have a, a child. He tells her later on, but he knew he was going to have a kid. But it sounded good to him, and this is what happens. A lot of us, when we want to step out of the, of the will of God, we look for people who are going to co-sign what we feel. I've seen it time and time again, especially in church. People come to, pastor, pastor, my husband, you know, want to say, oh, my wife is, 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 you know, giving me a lot of trouble. But there's a co-worker that, that, that I sense that God is bringing in my life. That's really my soul made, and, and I feel that my marriage was a mistake, and I was out of the will of God for so long, and, and that's why I've been in the wilderness for so long, but, but I feel that I need to correct this mistake by divorcing, and I said, that is the most absurd, craziest thing I've ever heard. You know, and I thank God for all the pastors and the leaders here. We're all on the same page, but you will find someone, you will, they will go out of their way, continue to talk to every pastor until they hear the advice they want. Because if they don't get it through the leadership, they're going to find one knucklehead, and you're going to find one crazy person in church. Do you, girl, do it. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Don't worry about it. You got to do you. You take matters into, it's never a good idea. When you're thinking, let me, let me force the hand of God. Let me, let me, let me do what I have to do. Let me, uh, let me do a plan B. Plan B is never the will of God. It may be a good plan, but it's not God's best. Amen? Finally, we don't listen to our own advice when we uh, don't think things through. When you didn't think things through. Now, Sarah, Sarah's plan fell apart quick. She had a lot of drama in her life. So we are told that Hagar had the baby. She was pregnant. I mean, she was pregnant. She was, uh, and she was walking around. Ooh, look who's having a baby. Abram, look, he's kicking. You want to touch the belly? And she said she looked at her mistress with contempt. So when he was rubbing the belly, she looked at him like, mm-hmm, look at you. And then Sarah was looking for someone to blame. But in all reality, who's put this plan in motion? And taking responsibility. And how many of us know that we have to take responsibility for our own actions? Even if we did the wrong thing, the right thing to do is to say, it's mine. But she playing the blame game on her husband. Her husband said, what do you want me to do? That's your servant. And so here we see all these things. What a mess. What a mess it happened. And this is what happens when we don't think things through. Right there at the moment it might seem good. But how many know that our plans may seem good? But God knows the future. God knows all the, everything that's going to happen. And there are times where he knows you leave this job and for a 
a better job and you don't even, this is the problem. This is the issue that I said. This is how you can solve all of that. Simply consult the Lord. All the bad stories where you see good people in, in the, like if David was on the roof, consult God, should I, should I meet this girl? God would have said, you crazy. Go back to the field, right? And we see it time and time again, but we don't want to do that. Why? Because we don't want God to tell us no. And because we don't want God to say no, we just do it. And some of us, it, it, people always do this. It says, it's better to seek forgiveness than permission. And so that's what happens, even with God, our relationship with God. You don't think things through. And many of us right now find ourselves in situations. And I heard of the response in the first service. Man, I wish I would have heard this sermon years ago. <laughs> and as I close, I want us to think of one thing, because a lot of us have made mistakes in life. But I'm so grateful that God never gives up on us. I, 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 see, I see it this way. You know, I'm on the highway, and I miss the exit. And I said, okay, the first thing I got to do is go to the next exit and head back, right? Make a U-turn and head back or, or reroute myself so I can get back. I don't continue to move forward. I continue to go forward. I eventually need to get to my destination. No, you're headed down the wrong path. You missed it. And what God is saying is time for many of us at this moment, you're on the wrong path, but you need to confess, admit your mistake, and repent, and head back. Turn towards the direction of God. In other words, say, God, I give you my life. I give you. No longer am I going to take my own advice. No, one, no longer I, I'm, I'm going to have people to hold me accountable. I'm going to be a person of the word. I'm going to trust in you. And once you begin to do that, you're going to see the difference that happens in your life. Last illustration. I promise. This, I'll give you a good example. All right, so when it comes to food, See, a lot of people, we all know that we should eat the right, right? Right? You should, why all of you want Dunkin' Donuts before the service? No, but see, you were there, right? See, a lot of us, you know, people think it's funny because they, 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 like, they take communion and says, well, that means because I took communion, I can eat two big... Big Mac later. No, that's not, the, that's not the way it works. Take care of yourself. Now, the days of your life are numbered. In other words, God knows the beginning and the end, but the, the health of those years. And many th- times people say this, it's going to work itself out. If you're bad with your finances now, and you don't think things through, and then later on you want to buy a house, and you look for somebody, can you co-sign? Can you co-sign? Nobody's going to co-sign for you. Why nobody's going to co-sign? Because you got bad credit. There are people that won't even marry somebody because you ain't, they got bad credit. And that's you, say amen. <laughs> What's your credit score, baby? Let me say, let me say. We can make bad decisions, and I think with food, with life, with everything, and we could take our own advice, and that's certainly God does not want us to do it. But God provides a repentance plan. And today, that's what I want to introduce you as I close. God's repentance plan. Because Jesus said we were all walking away from him. We were all sinners. But at our lowest, Jesus died on the cross. While we were yet sinners, Jesus died on the cross for us. He took on our sin. He took on the penalty because we had to pay the penalty. A penalty had to be paid, but he says, I'll pay. And he did it with his own life. He died on the cross, and he rose again on the third day. And because he lives today, we can have his righteousness. We can be made a brand new start, a brand new start. It doesn't mean that everything goes away right away. There's kind of some mistakes, like your credit score and all these different things, relationships. It may take a while, but you're going to allow the Lord to guide you, no longer listening to your own bad advice. For salvation. And how many of you say, I can't, I'm not, I refuse to listen to my bad advice anymore. Give yourself warning. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, this message is so practical, but so necessary, especially in the days that we're living in. We know, Lord God, that we make mistakes, but I'm so grateful that when we make mistakes, you said, if we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of unrighteousness. God can make you right. And some of you need to simply turn your life over to Jesus and say, Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. So right now, I want to give you an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Ask him right now, come into my life. Come into my life. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. 
I repent. I turn my life over to you. I was going in the opposite direction, but now I'm going to ask you to lead my life. Take over. My life is a mess, and I know it's going to take some time, but I'm going to trust in you with my life. I surrender my life to you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you said that prayer and you meant it with your heart, guess what? You're saved. You're a child of God. Praise the Lord. And, uh, and on our website, we have a salvation tab. Fill that out. There's a form we want you to fill out because we want to connect with you. The last thing, how many of us say, you know what? There's, I'm listening to, I, I want, I'm list, there's an area in my life right now, the bad advice is really strong and I want to come against it. And I want to make a stand. Declare right now, no longer listen to bad advice because it could be my emotions that are taking over. I, I, I feel that I, that I have no other choice. You feel that, that, that you haven't thought it through. Whatever the case may be, right now, you've grown impatient. Whatever it is, you're going to give it to the Lord. So if that's you, I want you to stand up wherever you are, and we're going to spend some time to worship. Wherever you are right now, if you're home, I want you to put that hand emoji and say, that's me, Pastor, that's me, that's me. And what we're going to do right now, just take a moment to, to just allow the Lord to minister to you or even those in your seat. Or if you know someone right now that's making bad decisions, could you, those who are sitting down, could you take a moment to intercede for that person and stand in the gap for that person and say, God, help them. So if that's you, if you want to stand in the gap for someone, you can stand up. As we're going to, I'm going to turn it over to worship team.